Congressman Jerry Litton believes that a democracy depends on informed people. He also believes our government should be more open and accessible to the people. To better inform you of what is happening in your government, Missouri's 6th District Congressman Jerry Litton invites Washington personalities to come to Missouri each month and join him in an unrehearsed, question and answer, open to the public town meeting to discuss key issues facing our nation. Dialogue with Lytton brings you closer to your government and Washington closer to you. You know, in view of the fact that everybody seems to be interested in presidential primaries and various state races and politics in general, I thought we would do something a little different for Dialogue with Lytton this time. For the first time in three years, we're going to have somebody as our guest. It's not an elected official or Washington personality that depends on uh, being reelected. We have a real uh, politician in terms of running campaigns because he's done it for a livelihood. He's probably the biggest name in political consultant in the country. He's the president of the American Association of Political Consultants. He has engineered more upsets in American political history than anybody I know of. He's big in size and success and in reputation. I'd like you to give a good Missouri welcome to Matt Reese. Matt. I seem to have messed up my, my microphone here. Uh, you know, I understand that Hubert Humphrey was here last month, and then they bring me in, and I feel like Frankie Avalon after Caruso, you know, on the same bill. And it's a tough act to follow. I'm glad to be here. I appreciate your, your having me, and please be nice to Frankie Avalon. <laughs> You engineered the upset win of John Kennedy in uh, West Virginia over Hubert Humphrey, and I've always followed that very carefully, how anybody could take a rich Catholic and beat a poor Protestant son of a druggist in poor Protestant West Virginia. And that had to be one of the exciting races you were involved in. Well, it was. Uh, you know, the, the, longer, the longer the time, Jerry, from, uh, from that 60 election, the more credit I get. And I seldom discourage that. Uh, um, I must say that when Robert Kennedy was in the picture, and he was the manager, that uh, he was the engineer. I was sort of on the caboose, uh, uh, working uh, in the ranks. Uh, it was, you know, uh, there are a few candidates in my life that, uh, and I hope I'm sitting with one of them, that uh, uh, make you look like a genius. John Kennedy had the qualities that, that, uh, that appealed. Uh, I, I think that he then went honestly and openly, listening to the people, talking to the people, telling them about, you know, uh, uh, some of us are old enough, some of us are old as my tie in this room. And we remember when Catholics were, were you know, the, remember the things about the Pope was going to have a, a direct line to the White House and the, some people actually, uh, uh, fell for that, and, and then John Kennedy disproved it. Uh, it was an exciting campaign. It was a campaign with lots of people. It was lovely to have lots of money. You know, I, 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 but I'm glad Papa Joe made all that money because, uh, yeah, because it allows you to communicate. You need to have some way to communicate the quality of the, of the personality, the quality of the thinking, the quality of the, uh, of, uh, of, uh, the character. And uh, we, we did have those means, and it was, was an exciting campaign. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr. was very much involved in that campaign, and he'll be sitting in that chair next month on the next dialogue. What was his role, particularly, in that, that effort? Well, th th there, was a, there was a place. I was in Logan County in front of the Smokehouse, which is a gathering place. 
I, I was driving a Dolphin then, and I could draw a crowd at the smokehouse because they wanted to see me get in and out of it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in Logan, there wasn't anything else to do. <laughs> but I was standing there with, a, with a, the county chairman, and he said, see that corner over there? 1960 this was. See that corner over there? And I said, yes. He said, uh, 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 I stood there with Eleanor Roosevelt. And I thought, well, Mrs. Roosevelt had been down here last year. And I said, when was this? He said, in 1933. Well, that corner, I mean, those people in, uh, Roosevelt meant so much to those people because, because uh, the coal operators had so enslaved them politically that when they got out from under that enslavement with the Roosevelt win, they wouldn't have voted for anybody else. They wouldn't have voted for St. Peter against Franklin Roosevelt. Very, very popular, revered. Franklin Roosevelt Jr. came in and we had great difficulty. We had, we learned that it was, that, that we could not send Franklin Roosevelt Jr. in to a, to a place to campaign and then two days later send John Kennedy because Franklin Jr. drew a bigger crowd, more enthusiasm. And, and uh, so he was very valuable in connecting the quality of that candidate to the quality of, of his father by actively campaigning and supporting John Kennedy. Very important in, uh, in West Virginia. Very, very important. The other gentleman involved in that particular race sat in that chair last month, and that was Hubert Humphrey. He wasn't as excited about that. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't like Franklin Roosevelt so much. Franklin said some things about it. Those of you that have questions, we have microphones around the room, and, and I'd like to ask you just to come to the microphone, ask your question, tell us who you are and where you're from, and we'll see what happens. Question here. Larry Spurgeon, Harrisonville, Missouri. We were speaking of finances just a moment ago, and there's been a lot of discussion about the campaign finance law, what with several court rulings on that. And I was wondering if you would comment on how this is going to affect campaignings this year. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that suggest that a candidate can buy the election, and I think it depends upon the individual campaign that's involved. And while there's no official lid placed on campaign spending as such, I think the people are going to place a lid on it. I don't think anybody wants a campaign to be bought. And I think if any candidate spends too much of his own money, and it's known, and it will be known, because the disclosure laws that are enforceable now, the people will react and see to it that he does not succeed at the ballot box. But the same token, if a candidate spends too much money overall in a lavish way, aside from just discussing the issues, I think the people will react against his spending. But if the candidate spends the money discussing the issues, talking about the economy, discussing energy, talking about foreign trade, agriculture, mental health, education, trying to communicate with the people, to let them know how he stands on the issues. So when they go to the ballot box, they can vote in an intelligent, informed fashion. I don't think they'll object to money being spent that way because they want to be as informed and as educated as possible on election day. Now those uh, who would like to see me not spend anything in St. Louis in the campaign, my question is, what am I about to say in St. Louis that the other candidates don't want me to say? Thank you. You know, Joe Kennedy one time sent a wire to a fundraising dinner that, that they had for Jack Kennedy, and he said, I don't mind at all buying the election, but he says, I can't afford a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't buy a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't get a landslide. No. <laughs> uh, I think, that, I think that, that money in campaign, when we're talking about that of, of the resources, is so very necessary for basically its, its ability, to, ability, I mean, allows you to communicate. That's what a campaign's all about, Jerry. And, and if you can't communicate between yourself and the voter, if your campaign cannot deliver the message that is Jerry Litton, uh, uh, then, then it's, uh, it's a shame. The voter themselves are, uh, uh, will be will be the the loser and that that kind of thing. I think we have too little communication rather than too much. I agree. The reason dialogue's good. There's been much uh, said about millionaires buying the race now since uh, the election law has been uh, the cap has been taken off. In today's parade section of our paper in St. Joe, there was an article in there that said that 20% uh, of the senators are millionaires, which means that 80% aren't. Uh, which means that they haven't bought it thus far. 
Jerry, do you know how many millionaires there are in the House roughly, or would you take a guess? It would not be 20 percent, I would not think. Uh, a lot of people have suggested that the Senate is a millionaire's club as such. Yes. Uh, I don't think there would be 20 percent, frankly. I think we have to recognize and realize, too, uh, that we want people in the House and Senate who are successful. We want people in the House and Senate who can make things happen, who can succeed, who can do well, who are bright, who are intelligent, who are articulate, uh, who succeed. And uh, success, nothing's wrong with success. Nothing's wrong with success at all. Matter of fact, I try my best when I hire people from my staff to get people who graduate, <coughs> not those who flunk out. And I think when we... Uh, And I'm, I'm not saying those who don't make a million flunk out, but I'm simply saying that I think it's wrong for us to suggest that anybody who has done well is not who we would want to represent us. Maybe he'd do well for us, too. And I worked hard in my lifetime. And uh, after I had done as much as I wanted to do in business, I decided I was ready to work as hard for the people as I'd work for myself. I find nothing wrong with that. Can, can you see the Republicans repudiating their own president at the convention, though? as a real possibility? Oh, of course. If, 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 if Reagan wins in the primaries, uh, 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 there's going to be awful pressure on the president to withdraw. Uh, uh, and, and this is an unelected president, remember. He does not have the mandate of, of uh, 60 million American voters, or 30 million, or whatever. He is unelected. And uh, uh, some feel that he's done a very poor job, an inept job. And Ronald Reagan is very skilled at presenting a case to a, well, what did uh, what did they call it, a minority of a minority? But, but that's, that's the Republican primary system. And uh, the people to the right seem to have control. And they push the president to the right, but, but he looks less real there, I guess, although that's where he's been all his public life, than Reagan does. Jerry, I'd like to ask you what your opinion is of the administration decision allowing the Condor, the SST, to start coming into Dulles and uh, upon certain things happening into JFK, bearing in mind that we're close to TWA and McDonnell Aircraft in St. Louis, et cetera. TWA in Kansas City and McDonald in St. Louis are not going to like what I'm about to say, possibly. Maybe they will. When we land our 747s in Paris and London, they charge us right at $3,000 a landing. When the airlines in England and France land their 747s in the United States, we only charge them $2,100. Now, until such time, as we charge the foreign airlines in England and France, as much to land here as they charge us, or they charge us as much to land there as we charge them, that SST can circle to kingdom come before I vote to let it land. Apparently that's not too unpopular here. Well, I'm just tired of us subsidizing foreign airlines and watching TWA be in trouble and Pan Am be in trouble. I'm tired of us buying friends all over the world. I'm tired of us giving Volkswagen and other car manufacturers and advantages over us. I'm tired of dairy farmers abroad bringing their dairy products into this country without meeting the same sanitation requirements that are expensive that our farmers meet. I'm tired of Australia bringing beef into this country and not accepting our live cattle. I'm tired of Japan bringing in televisions and ballpoint pens and not, expect, not accepting our surplus beef. I'm tired of all of these advantages that are given to other countries so we can buy their friendship. I'm just tired of it. Jerry, my name is Thomas Jefferson, better known as Tommy. I'm from Bremer, Missouri. And I'd like to ask you a question uh, as a consultant, uh, the trend over the United States of the participation of our youth from 18 to 40 years old, is it increasing? Has it increased, you say? Right. 
Well, uh, you and I are about the same age, and I, I, I classify youth 18 to 42, but uh, <laughs> uh, I think politically we have, to, we have to go like 18 to 24, 24 to 40. Uh, um, uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, you look at, at senior citizens, 65 and older, and, and you're probably looking at about 80% of them voting. You look at the 18 to 24 group, and, and you're, you're looking at about 10% of their voting. I, I, guess, I guess in looking at my own life and, and my friends, you sort of have to, to, to be about 30 and uh, have some responsibility, maybe a kid or two, before you, you realize that, that the problems that you might face in your daily life, life is connected to what the government does, and then you begin to participate. My question has to do with some of the techniques that are being used to advertise political campaigners, and I use that word advertising on purpose, because some of the techniques echo what we see in marketing products. For instance, in 1968, we were told about the new Nixon, which is kind of like talking about the new brand of Comet or whatever. Um, and one Madison Avenue executive has said that he thinks that there's will be a time in American politics when the man who steps into the voting box and hesitates between the two levers will be just like the man who goes to a drugstore and can't decide which tube of toothpaste to buy. Now, do you think that Americans feel that they've been misled by the kind of advertising that is done for political campaigners? Or do you think the same kind of techniques that were used to get Richard Nixon elected in 1968 can be used effectively by candidates in 1976? I don't know that, that the American people ever did buy Richard Nixon. I think that, that, that they selected him, not quite believing all of that, but because they preferred him to the alternative that year. Was he a beloved man when he carried 63% of the vote? No. Was he quite believed? Probably not. Were they successful in presenting him well and also uh, uh, countering his opposition to make his opposition look inept in, in comparison? Yes. If you'll go back uh, uh, early in television, you saw a man at his desk, uh, then it was a man, with, a, with his name tag in front of him and the American flag and either the Christian flag or the, or the motherhood flag or something back there, and he said, uh, I'm Matt Reese and. And then you went into to where he, with his coat over his shoulder in an open shirt talking with kids in the mountains or on the seashore. That was sort of the thing. But if you'll notice in 74, it, it, it became sort of blue background talking directly into that camera because the politicians recognized that that overproduction, that contrived sort of thing, was not what the American voter would accept in light of Watergate. It is advertising. Right here in Jackson, are we in Jackson County? No. Right over the border in Jackson County. <laughs> Back in 1966, I saw the greatest, the greatest, uh, uh, the most classic billboard I've ever seen. Re-elect Senator Snort, it said, or whatever his name was. He says, more roads, better schools, lower taxes. That was his theme. Now, you have to be a mongoloid idiot <laughs> to believe that you could have more roads and better schools with lower taxes in the system, the crazy system that we've got. So we deal in cliches. Our simple problems are all solved. We've got nothing but the hard ones. So we're, 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 we're forced into a, politi in a political campaign to try to tell the answer within that, that, uh, that familiar box that the voter is accustomed to looking at the politician. I know I'm not quite making sense, but it's very difficult. The real value of, a, of an issue, except those few that really tear at our, at our hearts, like abortion or uh, capital punishment or, or uh, uh, marijuana, those things where, where we, we do feel one way or the other, usually very strongly, but, but the, real, um, uh, the real problems uh, 
I've, I've lost my train of thought. I've got to apologize to you because the, the, the elastic on my, I wear these over the calf stockings. <laughs> and the elastic on the left one is loose and it just keeps slipping slowly down, <laughs> slowly down my leg. And it's driving me crazy. I've got to fix it. Pick it up. <laughs> I want to remember that the next time I lose my train of thought. <laughs> You know, when you're dumb, you have to have those kind of stories. <laughs> Does it also work for a thin man? <laughs> I don't know. I've never been a thin man. <laughs> How many of you in this room, before dialogue, regularly attended political rallies? <laughs> See? See? Uh, uh, that's, that's what I'm talking about. Jerry Litton's found the new way to communicate. He might send out the... <laughs> and that's important. And, and he's a better, you know, I, I don't know the man as well as I will. I suspect he's honorable and decent. But... <laughs> but, 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 but you better believe Honorable or dishonorable, he's a better congressman because he's gone through this. Because he knows. I, I saw John Kennedy in West Virginia, and he goes into Appalachia, uh, Jerry, and he had never seen that. He's a rich man from Boston, and he'd gone to all the fancy schools, and he traveled abroad, and he was very well educated. But he'd never, if it hadn't been for that West Virginia primary where he had to go, he'd have never seen those folks in, 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 in those hills who didn't have enough to eat, who were cold, whose, whose children had rickets and inferior uh, education, who, ha who had a lack of hope. The man saw it. It touched him. He wasn't a passionate man like his brother Robert. But, but, but... In, 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 in his own way, it was very touching to him. And really, the first thing he did on January 22, 1960, was an executive order for food stamps for special people, I mean, special areas, and this was directed towards Appalachia. Now, food stamps may have got out of hand, but when that went there, that was needed, and John Kennedy knew it because he'd been there. And the political campaign made him go there. It's almost inhuman, a political campaign. The agony that a man and his wife have to go through, the time and the exhaustion. But I think it's a, you know, I don't know a better way for Jerry Litton uh, to know St. Louis than to go there and to have to deal with those people. And you've taken this and you've educated yourself at their expense. I don't guess they know that. <laughs> but you've educated yourself at their expense, and you have to be a better congressman because of it. You know, Matt, when I got back to Congress, there was about 70 or 80 freshmen there. We met from time to time to discuss the problems of the economy and the country and the Congress, and then I met with the senior members of Congress from time to time, and I determined that the freshman congressman had a better grasp of the problems of the country, a better feel of the attitude of the people, a better uh, grasp of the concern of the average American than did those back there who were chairman of the most important powerful committees in Congress. The reason being, those freshmen had gone out and knocked on doors, gone to stores, walked the streets, been to meetings, listened to the people. And they went into office really in touch with the people. And so I decided that if we could have these kind of meetings, not only once a month here, but I've done them all over my district for three years, that I'd stay in touch. I didn't want to go back to Washington and become Washingtonianized, and it's awfully easy to do that. Try to stay in touch with the people you represent. And I learn not only from the questions that are asked here, but I learn a lot from the questions that are not asked. Because many of the questions that are not asked are the ones I thought would be asked. And that's not on their minds. And I need to know what's not on their minds as well as what's on them. It's pretty exciting. I really think that the, uh, a lot of the elections in 1976 are going to be based on 
Just plain, honest, to goodness, frank talk. Uh, I don't think people want to be promised more roads and more schools and more of this and more of that and lower taxes. I think they want a man that'll stand up and say, if we have more roads and better schools and better service, it's going to cost more money. Uh, pure and simple. I think that they're tired of, of excuses and promises that they can't be kept. I think we're going to have to realize that this country's going to have to go back to work, produce some products, produce some services. I think we're going to have to realize that we can't keep spending more than we make buying more goods than we sell, consuming more things than we produce. I think we're going to have to rewrite and restructure welfare. I think we're going to have to rewrite and restructure all of the laws and the books that discourage people from working. And I think they're going to be electing candidates who come right out, straight out, and say, look, this country is great. It has natural resources. It has fertile soil. It has technology. It, it's better than anybody in terms of computer space age technology. And we're buying more goods from other countries than we're selling. We're simply going to have to get back on the job and go to work and produce some products, and it's not going to come free, and it's not going to come easy. We're not going to be able to promise them shorter work weeks and shorter days and more play and, and less work. The people that are willing to stand right up and run for office and say, look, friends, we're going to have to go back to work, I think we'll be elected. <laughs> One final note, and I see we've run out of time, but Matt, have you got anything that you would suggest to the people here do as they watch the presidential primaries and the candidates vying for office? Is there anything that we ought to pay particular attention to between now and the Democratic presidential race that would give us a better insight? Well, I, I don't know. I, I think that, that, that you ought to take what you read in the paper uh, with the uh, a great deal of uh, of judgment, and uh, I'm, I'm trying to say, don't believe everything you read in the paper. Uh, understand? Uh, 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 these are I know many of these many of these reporters, and they're great, but they got to write something every day. So that, so they write something, and tomorrow they contradict themselves uh, because they found something else to write, and they're almost as confused as we politicians. Next month marks the start of the fourth year of these monthly Dialogue with Lytton sessions. Start of the third year that will be televised, and our guest next month will be Franklin D. Roosevelt, Jr. I hope you can come to these meetings. They're free and open to the public. If you can't, join us on the some 30 television and radio stations around the Midwest that carry Dialogue with Lytton. We'll bring government back to the people right here next month. Thank you. Each month, Missouri Congressman Jerry Litton invites a well-known Washington figure to come to Missouri and join him in an unrehearsed two-hour question and answer open to the public town meeting. This has been a 30-minute edited portion of this month's meeting. Dialogue with Litton is presented monthly on this station to keep you better informed about your government.